All right, again, we greet you in the name of the Lord. It's good to be here today to, to see all of your smiling faces, and we want to invite you to stand so that we can begin our song service today. Um, just sing out, worship the Lord, and He sees your heart, and He knows, he knows each one of us, and He is here to, to meet us. And so we want to come into His presence with expectation. Um, Pastor Pete uh, asked if we would sing this hymn this morning to begin the service. So we're going to start with uh, this hymn entitled, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Let's sing this together.
strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever. the YouTube video, the writer of this song, uh, Matt Redman, um, there's a video of him and his band playing in Times Square. And uh, there are thousands of people in, in the square, in the street, singing along with him. And it's a beautiful thing to see, to witness, and to realize uh, that the, the spirit of the Lord uh, was being praised, God was being praised in, in, that, in that place in New York City. Um, Another thought that came to my mind about this song is there was a, a serviceman in our service one week um, who told me after the service that when he was um, over in Afghanistan, he kept the lyrics to this song uh, in his pocket. And every night he would read the lyrics to this song and he would sing this song. And it held such significance to me. I never forgot that. Just imagining how this song ministered to him and helped him uh, and comforted him and strengthened him um, as he was over there in, in a dangerous country. Uh, but his Lord was with him and he was putting his full trust in him. And that's exactly what we need to do and need to remember. Uh, our lives are in his hands. This, in this life and in the life to come, and we'll be together forever. Um, one of the words that God uses to describe himself is Emmanuel, and that means God with us. He is with us, and he gives us the, the privilege and the honor uh, to bow before him in humility and in, in, in worship. And So let's continue to do that as we're together, just for this short brief time this morning, let's make the most of our time together and continue to honor and praise Him. Who are we that you would be mindful of us? What do you see that's worth looking our way? We are free
God. Praise you, Lord. Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25 read like this. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see that day approaching. Thank you, Lord. It's so good to come into his presence. Just as you are. of joy every fear suddenly wiped away here in your presence all of my gains now fade away every crown no longer
we're here in your presence this morning thanking you for the God you are. You brought us back together again this day to worship you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for loving us. Even when we were unlovely, you still loved us as a father loves his children. Father, there are needs before us on the bulletin. We lift them up to you. They're believers, Lord. Their faith is in you. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for answers to prayer. Oh, this week, many answers to prayer. Thank you. Father, be with our pastor and the group that's in Israel. Bring them back safety. Father, pastors following in your footsteps. Thank you. So, Father, change our lives this day. Don't just touch us, but change us as we submit ourselves to your will, your desire. As the word goes forth this morning, Lord, hide us behind the cross. We want you to be seen. Thank you. And Father, the persecuted church this day, we lift them up to you. Many Christians have been persecuted all over the world. Churches have been bulldozed. Christians have been sacrificed. But they're with you, Lord. So, Father, we thank you for our presence this day, for the Congress, for the Supreme Court. God, I pray that your will would be done. Many times we don't understand what's happening, but you are the one that's still in charge. Thank you for that. In your name we ask this. Amen. Go around, shake hands with others. Tell them God bless him. Good to see him in church.
its way through solid rock. There have been charlatans who, like Simon the magician, sought to barter on the open market this power which could not be bought or sold. But God has always had a people, men who could not be bought, and women who were beyond purchase. There have been times of affluence and prosperity when the church's message has been nearly diluted into oblivion by those who sought to make it socially attractive, neatly organized, and financially profitable. It's been gold-plated, draped in purple, and encrusted with jewels. It's been misrepresented, ridiculed, lauded, and scorned. These followers of Jesus Christ have been, according to the whim of the times, elevated as sacred leaders and martyred as heretics. Yet through it all, there marches on this powerful army of the meek, God's chosen people who cannot be bought, flattered, murdered, or stilled. On through the ages they march. This church, God's church triumphant, alive and well. Let the church rise from the ashes. Let the church fall. have changed, haven't they? Well, some, some have wondered why I haven't preached, and I'll tell you why. Last time I preached here in the morning, next morning I woke up with a stroke. So Betty says, honey, you better, you better be careful. A couple sitting in the front here. I'm her favorite individual next to her husband. She's my se second born daughter. It's scary. She calls herself Pete Jr. And it's really scary. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck, welcome. Good to see you. So. I had a stroke some time ago, so I have aphasia. What is that? It's spelled, if we look it up in the computer, 
A P H A S I A. It's called aphasia. It's a communication disorder that results in damage or injury to language parts of the brain. It's more common in older adults, particularly those who have had a stroke. Aphasia gets in the way of a person's ability to use or understand words. Sometimes I spell words wrong. Thank goodness for the computer that corrects them. People who have aphasia may have difficulty speaking and finding the right words. I know what I want to say, but sometimes it doesn't come out. Words to complete their thoughts. They may also have problems understanding conversation, reading and comprehending written words, written words and using numbers. I have three of those. Conversation, public speaking, and words are, yeah, numbers. So if we go out to eat, I tell Betty, honey, here's a tab, tab. you figure it up. Because sometimes I have problem with numbers, and I sure do have problem public speaking, you'll find out. What causes it? Aphasia is a, usually caused by a stroke or brain injury with damage to one or more parts of the brain that deal with language. According to the National Aphasia Association, about 25 to 40 percent of people who survive by stroke get aphasia. So that's my problem. pastor asked me some time ago, he said, Pete, he said, let me know when you're ready to preach. I don't know, but I'm going to preach. <laughs> I've never had the preacher's itch that I have to preach. I could sit back where you are and enjoy the service. So, but it's my turn. You wonder why the acts, well, that's my topic. Sometimes the axe head comes off and you can feel it in the axe handle. I'm going to share some thoughts on how sharp is your axe. I'm going to see there it is but I have it written out. We have here a rather unusual, intriguing story. Some of you may be familiar with this. Why is it in the Bible? What has it got to do with me? How can it have any bearing on my life today in the 21st century? It's a strange story. I believe there will be, there are some serious truths in this story that we need to look at. I'm going to spiritualize it. Elisha was a seminary professor. He had gathered to him a group of young men, sons of the prophet, preacher boys, being trained for the ministry but the class had grown too large. The students said, let's go out and cut down some trees and expand our facilities. We need larger facilities. Elisha was favorable to it. And he said, okay, we'll go down to the Jordan River and cut down some trees. So they go down to the Jordan River and take their axes and begin to cut down trees. 
one young man working very hard, making mighty swings with his axe when the axe head falls off the handle and falls into the Jordan River and it sinks to the bottom. The young man panics and he cries out, alas, it was borrowed. He did not own the axe. He borrowed it. This lad doesn't have much. He's a preacher boy, training. This is not how you began your ministry. He runs to Elijah and he gives him the news. My text is in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 to 7. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with is too small for us. Please, let us go to the Jordan and let us, every man take a beam from there and let us make a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, please consent to go with your servant. And he answered, I'll go with you. So he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. He cried out and said, alas, master, it was borrowed. So the man of God said, where did it fall? And he showed the place. So he cut off a stick, a magnetic stick. That's my translation. <laughs> and threw it in there. And he made the iron float. Therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached in his hand, took it. So Elisha asked, show me where you lost it. Elisha does something rare, rarely strange. He cuts this branch down and he tosses it into the water. <clears throat> and lo and behold, the axe had surface. I want to see that. Maybe, maybe they have replays in heaven. But that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yesterday, we had seven kids raking leaves. In the midst, I was helping, dumping them. I fell backward. My ears stayed on, but my glasses came off. I didn't miss them. When I went to the house, my daughter said, Dad, where are your glasses? Oh, I must have dropped them when I fell. Well, she said, let's go and look. Honey, we'll never find them in here, a bunch of leaves. So I took a rake and raked the leaves, and next thing I knew, there were my glasses. Honey, I had just bought them. Anyway, so King James says, the iron did swing, swim. That doesn't mean it was doing the backstroke. It was doing the breaststroke. It was maintaining itself. The, against the flow of the river. So the axe head was lost, but it was found. The loss of it was something significant. I love the Bible book of Acts. It's the acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the church did some tremendous exploits. And the book of Acts is not closed yet. Remember that. Never ends. How and why did they do these exploits? They had a power and boldness that tremendous things happen. Oh, sure, they had some defeats. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? By the way, those not couples, but they were cities. I'm sorry. They were couples. They lied to the Holy Spirit. Be careful, saints, how you treat the Holy Spirit. Do you ever feel there's something missing in your life? Maybe the ex head of God's power? missing in your life? 
Sometimes it seems as if we have lost something. There's something missing in our lives, power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. One preacher was asked, what is the anointing? He said, I don't know how to describe it, but I sure know when it ain't there. The ax head had been lost. It's the most important part of the ax. The rest doesn't amount to much without the ax head. That's where the weight and the cutting edge are. All have part from the ax head. All Christians have a part. It's only a piece of wood, wood that the handle is only a piece of wood. It's just a handle. But when the ax head is on it, you can cut down a lot of trees. You and I are the ax handles. It's our lives. The power and the presence, the performance of God are the ax head. Our churches are the handles. You are the handle. The two tools by which we apply the power of God to the world in which we live. If the ax head is gone, Jesus said, apart from me, you can't do anything. Ax handles just aren't worth much without the ax heads. We cannot expect to accomplish much without the ax head of God's presence, his power, his performance in our lives. When you rely on organization, when you rely on organization, you have that. When you rely on education, you get education. When you rely on eloquence, you get eloquence. But church, when you rely on the Holy Spirit, you get the working of the Holy Spirit. There are many things you can do with the power of God working for him. At times we seem to be working fearlessly, swinging our ax handles, but without the ax head, we don't chop down any trees. Clear any forest, make much of a dent. So we call a conference and some of our best trained people get up and tell us how to swing the ax handle better. Maybe we can do better the next time. But still, it doesn't work. It seems to make great impact. Could it be because we have lost something in our lives? Perhaps the accent of God's power is missing. Something experienced that. Maybe there's a message in this antiquated story. What we need to fear seriously consider. Let me give you three points. Now, I took homiletics one semester. Or was it two, honey? Anyway, you always have three things to share. So, number one, the loaning of the axe head, the losing of the axe head, and the locating of the axe head. Verse five, the loaning of the ax head. Alas, my master, it was borrowed. I am not the owner of myself. It's been graciously loaned to me by another. I didn't buy it. It's borrowed. It belongs to someone else, somebody else. He has let me use it. I've got to one day return it, and now I've lost it. I don't know how to explain it to him who owns it, because it never was really mine. 
to do with as I pleased. He loaned it to me for a season. Church, you're not your own, the Bible says. You're bought with a price. The Bible says every one of us will give an account of himself before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus. Things done in my body according to what he has done. So one a day, one day, we're going to appear before Jesus. Give an accounting. Your sins have been washed away, but what you did with what you had, what you did with the axe had, what did you do with it? Everything I has belongs to God. I'm talking about stewardship. We are managers. I am to use what God has entrusted to my care. My body, my time, opportunities, my job, family, wealth, even my house and car. Everything I have has been loaned to me by another. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So you and I don't even own ourselves. Our life is hidden in God. Every one of, of us will be accountable to God for what we have. And perhaps if we really began to analyze what we are using with what we have loaned to us, we too might cry out and say, alas, master, it was borrowed. It's not my hands. It's not my voice. It's not my life. I cannot afford to do it any way, my own. I'm not the captain of my ship because everything I have got, everything I have has been loaned to me by another. A story. Betty and I were in Bible school together until I met her. Green Lane, Pennsylvania, Eastern Bible Institute. Now it's become the University of Valley Forge. I have a hat, even though I went three years to Bible college, I have a hat now that says University of, University of Valley Forge. When we were at my last year of school, it was the last semester, we didn't know where we were going. I just knew God had called me to Bible school. He must have a plan for my life. So after chapel one morning, Betty was at work. There was a knock on our, 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 on our cottage. And I asked the gentleman to come in. He said, uh, I think he spoke in chapel that morning, telling us about New England. I'd always heard about Vermont. Pastor wanted to go there to start a church. I'll tell you the secret. He wanted to do that. But the Lord told him to write here. So this young man said, well, I'm looking for an assistant to take care of my youth. Well, it wasn't that many. They, the church was in a house. I think I got it. <laughs> Pardon me, folks. I should have brought the electric one was given to me last Christmas by my daughter. <laughs> and he said, uh, take a weekend off, come up and visit us. So we did, and we ended up there. My poor mother-in-law, she said, they will never make it. We 
put all of our longing, all of our belongings in a two-wheeled trailer. She said, he'll never make it, but we did. We worked there for a year. It was in Southington, Connecticut. But I'm working away going to Vermont. God is doing it, not me. So when we got to Lincoln, well, the superintendent called us and said, I have three churches that are open. I need a pastor in each of these churches. Take a weekend off, visit each one. So we heard a lot about Vermont. So I said to Betty, honey, let's go to Vermont. So where the church was in his house, the lady answered the door. She said, oh, you're the new pastor. I said, wait a minute, who told you that? I'm just looking the territory over. So I said, where's the previous pastor? Oh, he's across the mountain. And told me where he was. So I knocked on his door. He said, oh, Pete, come on in. I was expecting you. What? Who told you I was coming? God. And his, he had a farm in Virginia. God told him to sell the farm and go to Bible school one year. He'd never been probably farther than Pennsylvania. So God was, get this, God was his GPS. He felt led to turn here, there, and there, and he ended up in Lincoln, Vermont. Now, in Lincoln, Vermont, probably 400 people in the wintertime, but in the summertime, it quadruples. People have homes there to enjoy the Vermont. So we spent the night there. He said, why don't you take, take the church that we started? God will bless you for it. So we went back to Bible school and prayed, and God said, I want you there. We'd never been to Vermont. Spent six and a half years there. Loved it. Didn't want to leave. 11 o'clock one night, got a call from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Pastor said, Betty was sleeping. Pastor said, I want you to come home and preach for me. I'm resigning. So, and they'll vote for, on you for they receive you or not. So, we preached. Well, when the call came, I heard Betty groan. She didn't want to leave Vermont. I said, honey, I got to go. God's calling me. Well, I don't want to go. She can be stubborn at times. <laughs> Honey, I love you. <laughs> you had a birthday yesterday. <laughs> Mine's tomorrow. I thought that's why my daughter came to hear me preach. You all drove all the way from Maryland. She said, no, I came to celebrate your birthdays. I'll forgive you, honey. Where was I? I didn't write these things down as I should have. Our life is borrowed. It's God's life. And I'm proud to say that when he calls or wherever he wants me, I'll be there. I hope it's the next, next move. So our work, back to the ranch. Back, their efforts, labors are going to be judged whether they were evil or ill, evil or good. The word evil is not talking about wicked or worthless. It's talking about what we did with our acts the power of God in our lives. And I can say this, when we went to Lincoln, Vermont, probably eight people in the Sunday morning service. But when we left six and a half years later, there were 85 people. You know, God is good. 
just sow the word, preach the word. And when I was ordained in 59, they said to those who were going to be ordained, preach the word, preach the word. And I've tried to do that almost 60 years. So our works, our efforts, our labors are going to be judged. One of these days we're staying before God. So notice the losing. These. Three sentences I have shared with you. What, the losing of it in verse 5. He lost it while he was diligently in his work. This man was not lazy in his swinging. He's working away. He's active. He's involved. And this frightens me. Why? I've been involved in church since I was 12 years old. My children, the first Sunday they got home from the hospital, they've been in church. It frightens me because I see from this story that I can be deeply involved in ministry. I can be so busy about the church swinging the ax handle without the acts of God's presence and power in my life. We can get so busy and accomplish so little, we can go through church and wonder why people want to quit, throw in the towel, don't seem to be making much progress and when clearing forests, felling trees, tired, discouraged, defeated. I shared with one individual this past week. She said, I'm just tired. I'm, I'm worn out. Remember, you're in the people business. Your work is a ministry. Look, look at it that way. Remember when God spoke through the prophet Samuel through Saul, yeah, to Saul? Go totally destroy the enemy. You're to take no spoil, not even animals, from the battle. You're to kill all of the animals. Saul went into battle, and God blessed he won the battle. Saul returns in great triumph. Samuel the prophet goes out to meet him and says, Saul, did you fulfill all that God called you to do? Oh, yes, yes, Samuel. That's strange, the prophet says. I think I hear the lowing of oxen and the bleeding of sheep. What's that noise? Saul began to make excuses. Do we ever make excuses before God? God, I can't do that. Saul, well, he kept some of the best animals to sacrifice to God. But Samuel the prophet said, obedience is better than sacrifice. What is Saul saying? I want to save face. Saving face, face is more important than seeking God face and carrying out his will. Folk, you cannot save face if you want to see God's face. You cannot have it both ways. If the blessing and power and the presence of God are gone from your life, there has to be a reporting of it and a confessing of it. We cannot make excuses ourselves. Then there's a returning to it. The third phrase from that three point. The man of God asked, where did it fall? Show me where you lost it and had to backtrack to find where it was lost. Sometimes this is the hardest thing to do. God, forgive me. I've strayed from you. I've backslidden. 
then there's a returning to it. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do, isn't it? But it's the thing God holds us to. We must go back to the point of our failure, to where we walked off and left him, back to the place of our defeat. You cannot cover over it. God will do his part. The big word is if. If we confess our sin, he faithful and just forgive us. God will do his part. God, I'm sorry I've strayed, strayed from you. I need your love again. Have you lost it? Where did you lose it? In your home? In your relationship? With your wife, your husband? With your parents? On the job? At school? Did you lose it on a date? How long ago did you lose it? One year ago? That's too long. One month ago? That's too long. Yesterday? Do you want God's power back in your life? So Elisha cut down a branch and cast it in where the axe head was lost. Now the branch speak of Jesus. Isaiah said in chapter 53, he's a tender plant out of dry ground. He's our savior. When he died for us, he put it to where the ax head was lost and he applied it to the point of failure. Apply the blood of Jesus Christ to yourself. And it doesn't stop with just forgiveness. We get to go back to work for God. You don't have to wait. You're employed immediately. Back to where the job for Jesus. I never did finish that story about Vermont and New Hampshire. We did go to New Hampshire, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I probably preached one of my worst sermons. But they voted us in, 98%. That's unusual, voting a pastor with that high. And the 2% that voted against us came up afterward. We spent some couple months and they said, we're sorry we did that. But we wanted to hear more pastors anyway. I'm thinking about Vermont. We pulled up Lincoln, Vermont. They said, you won't find any jobs here. We're doing the recession. I said, God will take care of us. I wasn't concerned. So they hired us in Virgins, Vermont. Good job. So I worked there a couple months and laid off. I was laid off. So they said, you haven't worked here long enough. We can't pay you, but you have to draw from Connecticut. I had a good job there. Betty did too. So we wrote to Connecticut. People, God is so faithful. I drew unemployment from Connecticut, $63 a week. And I was making that where I worked in Virgins. So during this time I was laid off, I visited people in Lincoln, wasn't it many because 400 people. So the last week of my unemployment, I was called back to Virgins. They made airplane parts. See how God, I was, Connecticut paying me unemployment. What I was, 
got from the factory. God is so faithful. Church, trust him. Maybe some of you thinking about a new job. Maybe you, they've called you to come for an interview. Trust God. He never fails. So I'm thinking of David, how he messed his life up. I can look back at my, oh sure, we've made some mistakes. But you know, God has been faithful to us. This, this is just a minute, minute, minute part of our story. Betty and I, we look back, sometimes I can't sleep during the night. I pray. God refreshes my mind how he has been there time and time and time again. We built a church just like this in Portsmouth. We had a church at C200. We filled that up twice every, every, on Sunday. So we built. And one time, we were short. Betty says, five or 7,000, I don't remember. Friend of ours stopped in from Maine and he said, uh, how's the building doing? I said, it's that all winter. We ran out of money. He said, look, my brother is a cement worker. That's his job. He gets some wheelbarrows out. He said, he'll be down in two weeks to check it out and he'll do it for nothing. The floor was unfinished. We couldn't use it. We used the day care center. But I look back at that. We were short five, eight thousand dollars. We didn't have any insurance, so I put bought a bond every month in case we needed some insurance. So God told me, "You put that in the offering. Do that." I said, God, you've got to protect us. And we'd put it in the offering. And the bill was due Monday morning. This was previous a week. And so there's knock on the door the next morning, Monday morning. He was a flyer. Peace Air Force was there. He said, Pastor, God told me, if you can do what you did, I can do what I'm going to doing. He didn't know how much we needed. He wrote a check for the church, and there it was. Folk, God is so faithful. Why do we doubt him? He is faithful. In closing, God. To God be the glory. I didn't have these in my notes, but I just felt led to share them. How are things with you and God? One day you're going to stand before him. What did you do with your life that God gave you? Did you serve him? Have you invited Christ into your life? These are serious questions. New need to answer. Nobody else can. Let every head be bowed and every eye closed. Spirit of God has been here in such a beautiful way this morning. Have you invited Jesus in your heart? heart. You need to do that, friend. If you're, the Bible says all of sin is Jesus living in your heart. He wants to. He died on the cross for you. He said, I'll come again and receive you 
to myself that where I am, there you may be also. If you'd not invite Jesus into your life, just slip up your hand. I want to pray for you. Yes. Father, take these rambling thoughts that we've shared this morning. Take this message. We want to be hid behind the cross. Take this message and stir our hearts because sometimes we get so busy working in the kingdom that we neglect the king. So, Father, if there's one here this morning that needs to come back to find that axe head that came off the handles, so, Father, take these thoughts and may we remember them throughout the week that you want us on fire. Neither lukewarm, you want us hot or cold. So, if God, take this message that we have shared. Help us to remember the story. It has a spiritual meaning. Your name be praised. Amen. Thank you, folk. God bless you. It's been a privilege to share with you. Thank you. God bless you.